We've been talking about this for the last several months. If you've been here, just how we are as a church, we are wrapping up our multiply initiative and we've been asking everybody to do three specific things. All right. So I just want to remind you about those. First, I'm asking everybody in our church, both locations to pray, to seek the Lord and ask the Lord what would he would have you do as a part of the multiply initiative. And so speaking about prayer, this Thursday, I want you to know, uh, we just came up with this this last week, and I love alliteration and all this kind of stuff, and you'll see why. But on December the 12th, which is Thursday, so 12-12, we're going to pray for 12 hours that day. So pray for 12 hours on 12-12. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., all right, we're going to open our uh, building here in Canton and offer uh, for anybody to come throughout those 12 hours, because 6 plus 6 equals what? 12, you guys are so smart. All right. So 12 hours on 12, 12, starting at 6 a.m. until 6 p.m. And so if you want to come by and pray uh, before you go to work, the building will be open starting at 6 a.m. or after work. Uh, it'll be open until 6 p.m. because we just want our church to pray. Again, we just want to offer it out there to you to say, if you want to come and seek the Lord, it's not going to be scheduled or programmed. It's just going to be open throughout the day. We'll have specific things for you to pray for, but we want you to set aside at least 12 hours. If you can't come, obviously you can do this on your own. Maybe you want to fast during that time just to seek the Lord and say, God, what would you have me do? The second thing we've been asking our church to do is if you made a pledge commitment to multiply, and I've talked about what those numbers are, we're asking you simply to finish your pledge commitment because a lot of families in our church pledge and we want you to finish that. And then the third thing is give on multiply giving day, which is next Sunday. A lot of you weren't even here when we did, when we started the uh, multiply initiative and maybe you didn't make a pledge, but you can still give. And if you did, then this is a great day to try to finish your pledge. So that's coming up on uh, December 15th, next Sunday, a week from today. And, and I've communicated to you what we pledged and where we're at in that. But I, I want to say another kind of thing to go along with that is when we started this, we felt like from where we were as a church that we could realistically from when we started this series multiply seven weeks ago to the end of the year that we could at least bring in $600,000 as a church. And so far, I want to encourage you, we've already given 132000 towards Multiply, which then makes that goal $468,000 left. Now, you may think, man, $400,000 in one weekend? That's crazy. But I want you to know something, because maybe you haven't been here very long. But several years ago, when we, did our, when we finished out the second floor of our kids' building, it used to be our offices, we had one day of giving, and we set our goal at $200,000, but you guys are so generous, we beat that goal and brought in $400,000 on one Sunday in order to finish out our kids' area. So I want you to understand this is completely doable for us as a church, and that was years ago, and our church is larger and different now. And so we really believe that God can do miraculous things. And so I want to communicate that to you just simply to pray and ask the Lord, what would he would have you to do? My family and I were doing the same thing. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more on in the sermon. All right. So if you have a Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 26, Matthew 26. And then we're going to go to John chapter 12. And then we'll come back to Matthew 26. We're going to see the same story in two different gospel accounts. All right. Same story in two different gospel accounts. And then after the sermon, we will come together and celebrate baptisms, all right? So Matthew 26, but as always, before we get started, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together, all right? Pray with me. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you that you have given us the greatest gift. And God, everything that we have is from you, your word. And so God, I pray as we open up your word today that you would speak to us. You would communicate your will to us. God, help me to communicate it in a way that not only honors you, but is helpful to us. And so would you open up our eyes, open up our ears to see and to hear the truth and then be changed as a result of it. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna see this story in Matthew 26. We're gonna start in verse six. We'll work our way down to verse 13. Then we'll go over to John chapter 12, verse one through six and get more detail into the story, all right? So Matthew's gonna set it up for us and then John's gonna fill in some of the gaps. Matthew 26, verse six, it says this. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment. And she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. Verse 8 and 9. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, 
Why this waste? Now, I highlighted that point because that's the title of my message, all right? Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Now, let's stop and talk right there for a second. Contextually, you need to understand where this is in the story of Jesus. This is pretty close to him going to Jerusalem. In fact, Bethany was very close to Jerusalem. It was on the other side of the Mount of Olives, which on the, the temple side of the Mount of Olives was the Garden of Gethsemane. So literally when Jesus prayed, he could see where he was about to head to. Bethany's right on the other side of that. It's on the north side of that. And this city, Jesus would frequent often. He would go back and forth from Bethany to that side of the mountain before he would go in to be crucified. So geographically, that's where it's at. But the, in Matthew, he doesn't tell us any more detail about the significance of that city. He just tells us that in that city, a woman comes up to Jesus and then breaks this expensive ointment on his head. And then the disciples see that and they're like, what a waste. Why in the world would you do that? Now, again, you need to understand kind of contextually, just imagine sitting at a table and, and you're there and, and then this woman comes, breaks a jar and then pours this ointment on Jesus's head. To us, that would be really weird. Like someone just coming and pouring some stuff on your head. You'd be like, bro, you just messed up my Instagram photo that we were about to have right here. All right. You totally messed up my hair, everything I got going on. But you need to understand that biblically speaking, when you would anoint somebody, that is a way to bless them because they are set apart for a special task. And so this woman, I think she, I don't know if she understood exactly what she was doing, but Jesus is going to tell us the significance of what she was doing. He says to the disciples, this isn't a waste. This is a beautiful thing that she's done. And so this is in the context of a, of a, again, they're just sitting at the table. This woman breaks this thing. And their argument is that this perfume is so expensive, it shouldn't have been wasted on Jesus. And Jesus being Jesus knew what they were saying. Now, I'm not trying to sound, sound sacrilegious here, but I hear people you know, quite often over the years say, man, I wish I could have walked the earth with Jesus. And I got to be honest with you, and I've said this before, I don't really think I would have wanted to. Because the Bible says he could read your thoughts. And then he had a habit of addressing them. Can you just imagine that? Like, I am so grateful for the Holy Spirit. And I look forward to Jesus returning, but hanging with Jesus at a table and him knowing what I'm thinking and talking about and addressing the public with it would have mortified me. And this is one of those places. He, he turns to them, he knows what they're saying, and he says, why are you troubling this woman? She's done a beautiful thing. Now flip over to John chapter 12. All right, John chapter 12. So you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Verses one through six. You know, a lot of the events in the gospels were written from different perspectives. Not all of them are repeated in every gospel. Each one for different reasons, written to different audiences at different times. But most scholars believe that John chapter 12 is the same story of what happened in Matthew 26, but yet John fills in the details that Matthew doesn't. So listen to how John describes this event. John chapter 12, verse one. Six days before the Passover, so that's important because it's right before Jesus would go to be crucified. Jesus therefore came to Bethany. Again, same detail there. But John's gonna highlight something about Bethany that, John, that Matthew doesn't where Lazarus was. Oh, okay, so Bethany is the place where Lazarus was. Who's Lazarus? Look at how he says it next. Whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Oh, okay. So that dude that Jesus raised from the dead is from Bethany, and Jesus is at a dinner in Bethany, the hometown of this guy, Lazarus. And if John is saying that he's the guy that Jesus raised from the dead, then we can surmise, oh, this is after he was raised from the dead. You track it with me? All right. So they gave him, or they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served. Of course she did. <laughs> if you know anything about Mary and Martha, we will talk about them at the beginning of the new year. Mary or Martha served, 
And Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. So you see the context. They're at a table. Lazarus is reclining. Martha is serving. Well, they have a sister, Mary. Where is she? Look at verse three. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So John fills in the detail of this woman. This woman is Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who was raised from the dead. She is the one who is breaking this ointment on Jesus and anointing him. And it's so pungent, like you can smell it, that the whole house was filled with perfume. Well, who are the disciples that were upset? John tells us, look at verse four. But Judas, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, parentheses, in case you forgot who he is, he was about to betray him. So obviously this is written after, John's filling in the gaps. Don't you want, don't want to forget who Judas is. The one who was about to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Oh, so Mary's the one who did it. Judas is the one who's griping about it. Judas is the one who's making a big deal about it. Well, what's up with Judas? Why is he hating on Mary? Well, look at the next verse. Verse six, he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. How about having that written in the most publicized book in the entire world about you? He was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Aha! <laughs> now we know. Now we know why our boy Judas is upset about this. She breaks the expensive ointment all on Jesus and Judas doesn't get his cut. That's why he's mad. He's not mad because it should have been given to the poor because he don't care about the poor. He's a thief. He's mad that the money didn't run through his hands because he would like to help himself a little bit. A little for you, a little for me, a little for you, a little for me. Now, the Bible says that it was expensive, about 300 denarii. Now, any of you traffic in denarii? I didn't think so. So let me give you some context about how expensive this is. We know that a day's wages at that time was typically one denarii. So if that's the case, and this is 300 days wages, other translation tells us it was about a year's wages because the way they counted, they didn't, wouldn't have counted uh, Sabbaths and holy days into what they were paid. So this is a year's wages. So just a little context. I, I, I looked up, what is a year's wages, an average year's wages here in Georgia? So according to most people, it's right around this number, $56,183. So let's just say that's the high end but let's go with the 300 days thing. So if that's 365 days, if you divided that by 365, then multiply that times 300, you get $46,177. That is some expensive Chanel. $46,000 of perfume just broken on Jesus' head and his feet. And Judas is like, why the waste? Now, let's, can we just be honest? Most of us here, I'm not trying to say that you have to sympathize with Judas, but most of us would be like, well, he kind of has a point. $46,000. $46,000. A perfume. They, she just broke at one time. Most or some scholars say that, well, man, they must have been wealthy to have something this expensive. But most scholars believe that this was actually a family heirloom. A family heirloom that it would have been passed down in their family because, remember, they didn't have banks back then. So this would have been something kind of passed down like a, a, an inheritance, if you will. Like if all else fails, 
you got the perfume. Right? And listen, bro, if it was worth $46,000, I'd do the same thing. And yet here this woman is, Mary, breaking it on Jesus. Let's just be honest. If we're looking at this story, you're like, well, he kind of has a point. Sounds like a waste. But here's what I want to show you. I don't think it was a waste. And here's the reason why I don't think it was a waste. You ready for the deep theological reason? Because chapter 12 comes after chapter 11. Let's pray and go home, all right? I went to seminary for that answer, baby. You're like, I know chapter 12 comes after chapter 11. I'm setting you up. What I'm saying is, you got to know what happens in chapter 11. If you want to know why she did what she did in chapter 12, then you need to know what happened in chapter 11. And what happened in chapter 11? You don't have to turn there. It's not on the screen. I'll just recap it for you. Jesus was doing ministry in the region, and he got word that a guy that he loved named Lazarus was dying. And specifically, the Bible says that when he got word, he made sure he waited a few more days. And Lazarus died. Then he goes to Bethany. Again, remember, he would go back and forth over this mountain. He goes over to Bethany. Lazarus is dead, been dead four days. If you've been dead four days, you're, you're dead, dead, all right? Like certified, qualified, dead, wrapped up in a rock. And Jesus shows up and he sees everybody crying and Martha and Mary come to him and say, where were you? Where were you? If you were here, our brother wouldn't have died. Jesus sees them in the shortest verse in the Bible that you should at least have this one memorized. Jesus wept. Now, why did he weep? Because he's seeing the emotional effects of death. And then he says, roll that stone away. And when he rolls it away, they're like, uh, listen, I know you, Jesus, but it stinks in there. You probably don't want that smelling up the house. Jesus says, you do what you can do by rolling a stone away and you let me do what only I can do. And then Jesus says these words, Lazarus, come out. And what does Lazarus do? He does what any dead person when they hear the voice of Jesus does. They come alive. They come alive. And they walk out of death. And then Jesus tells them, remove the grave clothes, which is a sign not only that he overcame death, but he was freeing him from what bound him in his death. Let that boy walk in freedom. And then in the end of John chapter 11, word gets around and some religious people and Jewish people start trusting Jesus. I think I would too. And then the Bible says that Jesus didn't want to hang with Jews that much anymore because they wanted to kill him. So he goes up to a place called Ephraim. And he's hanging there. And then in chapter 12, it tells us that they have a dinner. Here's my opinion. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were like, hey, we need to have a party. He was dead. Now he's alive. Somebody sent word to Jesus up in Ephraim. We're having a party. So they bring him back. They're eating in Bethany again. And here they are, Lazarus is chilling. <laughs> Just imagine that party. Bro, you were dead. Four days. And now you're here. How about a party trick? <laughs> and Martha's serving. And what is Mary doing? Mary's doing exactly what you would have done if Jesus just made your brother alive too. She takes what was most important to their family, worth a ton of money, and breaks it on Jesus, blessing him because he just made her brother alive. So when you understand chapter 11, you understand chapter 12. Mary is sitting next to her once dead brother, now alive, and Jesus. And she does what any human heart who understands who Jesus is and what Jesus does, she blesses him in return for how he has blessed her. 
And when you read that, you're like, well, then that's not a waste. That's not a waste. And, and the reason why I'm telling this story is because you guys need to understand that you and I are Lazarus. You and I have our own chapter 11 story. Chapter 11. You know, that has some significance in our American legal system. Chapter 11. What is chapter 11? It's when you file bankruptcy. When you file bankruptcy. Let me read this definition of a chapter 11. It is a form of bankruptcy that involves, now don't miss this, a reorganization of a debtor's debts. I love that word, a reorganization of a debtor's debts. And here's what I'm saying to you. Every single one of us are just like Lazarus. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We're dead. We have a debt that we can't pay. And when you understand that you have a debt that you can't pay that leads to death, and you understand that all the Lord is asking you to do is to admit that, to file chapter 11 bankruptcy and let him reorganize your debts so that he takes all of your debt, places it on Jesus. He takes all the riches of Jesus and places it on you. And he takes your death and you get his life. You would do the same thing that Mary did. When you understand that you were dead and Jesus made you alive. Again, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I have to imagine that Mary would not have done this without talking to Martha and Lazarus. So just imagine that conversation while Jesus is over in Ephraim. She's like, listen, we're going to throw a party. And guess what? We're going to break our family's bank account. We're going to break the most important thing to us, the most expensive thing to us. And we're going to give it to Jesus. Just imagine what Lazarus had said. Well, I don't know. I mean, what has he done for me? You think that's what Lazarus' response was? I'm preaching so hard. I'm preaching my mic off my ear. No. I think Lazarus would be like, yeah. Yeah, that's what we should do. I was dead. I was dead, like D-E-A-D, -E dead, four days, dead, smelly dead. <laughs> so smelly dead that their house stunk of death. And then Mary says, we need to do something to change the perfume in this house. We need to do something to change what this house smells like. It doesn't smell like death anymore because he ain't dead. It needs to smell like life. And so you read that story, and this is why Jesus says she has done a beautiful thing. And church, here's what I'm saying to you. When we're talking about giving, I'm talking about giving as though you're a Lazarus, as though you're a Mary who you have seen Jesus bring to life people that you loved who were dead. And when you look at it like that, it's not a waste. It's not a waste. Now, I want you to, if, if you'll allow me for a second. You know, I've been preaching for months, years actually. 10 years at this church in January. And it's my job as a pastor to lead, to communicate vision. Here's where we're going. Here's how I think we're going to get there. And it takes all of us giving to make it happen. And if we're not careful, then, then myself and you, we can forget that, yes, I'm a pastor, but this may shock you. I'm also a human. And as a human, I have to deal with the same wrestle in my own family of, all right, Lord, what would you have us to give? 
And so I, I want to make this as personal to you, for you as I can. In March of 2017, when we started this Multiply initiative, and Lindsay and I have been married in January 19 years, and we've done, I think, six giving initiatives in our marriage. And when we made this commitment, it was the largest commitment we've ever made. The largest single commitment we've ever made. And the way Lindsay and I do that is she prays and I pray. It's like rock, paper, scissors, and we throw out a number. And every time it's like, all right, this is what the Lord wants us to do. And it was the largest number ever. And on Giving Sunday in March of 2017, we tithed the 10% of that total amount that day and then made a commitment to give over the next two and a half years. Two months later, in March, I mean, in May of 2017, Lindsay was out of town. It was on a Saturday. I went out to the mailbox like, you know, anybody does. And in my mail that Saturday was this bright neon postcard from my local Cherokee County jail saying that I had papers waiting for me and I needed to come get them. So I did what any human would do. I Googled that. <laughs> what does that mean? Am I about to be arrested? And I found out that what that means is someone is suing you and you have to go get the paperwork. So I called and they said, that office is closed on Saturdays. So you have to come on Monday. Of course it is. And in between Saturday and Monday is a Sunday. And I had to preach that weekend. I just looked it up before last service. You want to know what I was preaching on that weekend? By faith alone. And I was about to go through something that was about to stretch my faith. Lindsay and I were supposed to leave on that Monday morning and fly out as a part of our church planning network to a retreat for pastors and their wives for two days on emotional healthiness. We're supposed to fly out that morning, but I, I had to move the flight because I had to go to the county jail. So I was there that morning at 8 a.m., walked back through all the security, walked back towards the pods, feeling like a criminal, into an office, and I get a stack of papers this thick, and I find out that I'm being sued, not a criminal matter, all right, civil, I wasn't going to jail, but I flipped through the pages by myself, and when I got to the page of what they were suing me for, it was the exact same amount of what I had committed two months earlier. Same numbers, same comma placements. And for the first time in my life, I felt so alone and so scared. I couldn't call anybody because they took my phone. Thinking, Lord, we just made a commitment. And now we're being sued. And it was for a past real estate deal several years before that. For the exact same amount. What do I do? So I leave, call my I didn't call my lawyer. I didn't have a lawyer. Call my real estate agent. I need to find a lawyer. Go find a lawyer. And because of that, the delay, and then we get to the airport, I'd move my flight to noon, and then our flight was delayed. And we didn't get to the retreat until that night, and I missed the first two sessions of emotional healthiness. And that kicked off a season in my life two and a half years of arguably the hardest time in my life. So hard that I put on over 40 pounds. Don't act like y'all didn't notice, all right? <laughs> well, I was wondering. Because I was taught in my family, our counselors are Ben and Jerry. So straight up, I, I have no problem admitting that to you. I didn't know where to turn, I didn't know who to turn to, and it kicked off a season of my life of everything seemingly, in, in my eyes, falling apart. And Lindsay and I made a commitment that we, we, we would not stop giving to multiply. 
We just backed off the amount, but we gave consistently. Because I didn't know how much I was, this, the amount was the floor, not the ceiling. It could go way up from there. And for two and a half years, preaching to you every week, we fought this. It was not settled until August of this year. So for two and a half years. And now I have a ton of legal fees for a pretty small settlement. And once it was settled, then the process it has to get dismissed and you have to come to terms and all that. And so my court date, here's what's crazy. If it was gonna go to trial, my court date was the day before we were to leave for Israel. Which means if it went to trial, I couldn't go to Israel. The last day to file the dismissal. The last day to file the dismissal. November 6th. A guy in our church had invited some of our pastors to go to a one-day conference. You want to know what it was called? Emotional healthiness. In fact, it was the exact same conference by the exact same husband and wife that Lindsay and I had missed the two sessions of two and a half years prior. And I'm sitting there, Lindsay wasn't able to be with me, and I'm sitting there, and right after I finished the first two sessions that I missed, I get an email from my lawyer. It's finished. It's done. Lawsuit over. And I immediately broke down, and I felt the Lord say to me, I just gave you back what was stolen. This lawsuit stole, stole those two sessions and these two and a half years. And I just gave it back to you. Now it's time to get emotionally healthy. Now, I haven't had a pile of cash show up on my doorstep. I still owe legal fees. But Lindsay and I are doing everything we can to finish our pledge commitment this year. And I'm saying that to you so that you'll know a couple things. One, you'll know I'm human too. God does not have a protective bubble around his pastors. In fact, if anything, Paul says, if you want to glorify God, you will suffer. They go hand in hand. And I stand here before you today saying this to you. It's worth it. You want to know why? Because anything that we give to Jesus is not a waste. And I'm willing to make my own family sacrifice in the same way that I'm asking you to. Lindsay and I sold our house this summer and moved to a smaller place so that we could give to multiply. So I'm not asking you to do anything that we're not asking to do, but here's why I'm asking you to do it. Look at Matthew 26, verse 12 and 13. Jesus said this about what Mary did. He said, in pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And guess what? We're here today in 2019 talking about her. We're here today talking about what she did, what Judas thought was wasteful. Judas said, that's wasteful, $46,000 for Jesus? And Mary said, that's nothing. Look at Lazarus. That's nothing. My brother's alive. This is the resurrection and the life. Why would I do anything less than what the world would consider wasteful? And church, I want you to understand something. When she did that, that prepared Jesus for burial, and that enabled the whole gospel to go to the whole world. And we're still talking about Jesus and Mary. Let me ask you a question. Was it wasteful? Was it waste? No, because when we went to Israel, there's a place just outside the city that's a barren field. Still barren to this day, 2,000 years later. What is that? That is the field where Judas hung himself. 
And when he gave his money back, the Pharisees bought that field and it's the field of blood and the Bible prophesied nothing will be there. It is barren to this day. Which story do you want? Judas or Mary? Judas or Mary? I don't know about you. I'll sacrifice whatever I got to sacrifice. Because Jesus made me alive. And since he made me alive, this isn't even a sacrifice. I mean, to what level of importance is the family heirloom to the family? What you would be willing to trade in for a family member to know Jesus? What price? It's not a waste. And some of y'all here today, you're like, bro, I'm just here to see my niece get baptized. And you're up here with this stuff? I, I want to acknowledge that. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> I'm like this all the time. But you want to know why this is the best sermon you could hear? Because this has everything to do with baptism. You want know what baptism is a picture of? Dying. Sins covered. Coming back to life again. The people that are going to get baptized in just a minute are present day Lazaruses. They filed chapter 11 bankruptcy. They've had their debts reorganized. And now they're going to do something that other people would think is wasteful and weird. Can't we just be honest? Getting baptized in a tub in front of hundreds of people is weird. It's weird, man. I don't make any bones about that. It is weird. But it's not wasteful. Then why do we do it? Because we want the world to know what's happened to us. And here we are talking about giving. Listen, the best gift you could give Jesus is you, your life, your soul. You saying, man, I am bankrupt. Please take my debts that have led to my death. So man, this is the perfect Sunday that you're here. Maybe you don't even go to this church, but God's gonna lead you to give something that others will be like, that is wasteful. Praise God. Anybody about Revolution Church, it's about the gospel going to the whole world. I got a meeting this week about starting another church in Kenya. We just had a meeting this last week with our church planning network about getting more guys in our network so we can plant more churches. That's what this is about. Taking the gospel to the whole world. And until you've given in a way that your tax accountant will be like, oh, that's wasteful. And then you, by grace, can be like, no, it's not wasteful. Ma'am, sir, because let me tell you how he wasted his life for mine. Let me tell you what he did for me. This is the least I can do. Because one day we're going to be up in heaven having another party, watching Lazarus dance, and watching Mary be like, it was all worth it. $46,000. What is the price of a life? So as we wrap this up, a couple things. One, if you've not given your life to Christ, that's the best gift you can give today. Two, as we pray and prepare for next week, so all I'm asking you to do is pray and ask the Lord what he would have you do that other people would think that's wasteful. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us life. And in order for us to have life, Christ had to die. And one of the reasons why he raised Lazarus from the dead when he did it was to show his disciples that he has power over death. 
The reason why he could raise Lazarus is because you were going to raise him. And so God, I pray if there's anybody in the house or listening today that has never gotten to that point where they have filed chapter 11 bankruptcy, where they have understood that they are in debt up to a point that it's gonna lead to death. And God, would you speak to them today to let them know that they don't have to die in that debt. They'll simply confess and believe in Christ. You will reorganize that debt. You will put that debt onto Christ and put his riches onto them and they'll be saved. Nobody looking around or talking here as we close. If you've never had that moment where you have admitted and filed chapter 11. I'm gonna simply lead you in a prayer to do so where you're confessing and believing and therefore being saved. So if you wanna trust Christ, you can pray with me, not out loud, and it goes like this. Say, Father, thank you for loving me that you sent your son in my place for my sin. I confess I'm bankrupt in debt that's leading to death. But in Christ, would you make me alive? Would you save me? Would you forgive me? I believe you raised him from the dead and that in him you will raise me too. Give me life. Thank you for loving me. Again, nobody looking around or talking as we close, but if you just prayed to trust Christ, very simply, we want to know about that so we can celebrate with you. So would you just simply lift your hand up so we can see that? Just lift it up. Thank you. Thank you. We got men and women going to walk around and put a gift in your hand, and when they do, you can put your hand down. You're alive. And church, I want you to understand the reason why they're alive is partly because you gave. In a moment, we're gonna celebrate baptisms and that's people coming to life because you were willing to do something what others would call wasteful. But it's never a waste when you're investing in the kingdom of God. And so as you pray this week, I wanna ask you, be so bold to ask the Lord, what is wasteful? in the eyes of the world, but in your eyes is beautiful. And then be so bold as to give. Father, again, thank you for this. One day it would all make sense when we see you and everything that we have done in your name for your glory will have been worth it. So thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.